want to welcome you this morning to Harvester. Uh, we're glad you're here, and I want to say thank you uh, for, uh, to our church family, to all of you who have been praying. I know some of you knew I had to be out of town last week because of my father. Um, he was in the hospital, but I want to thank you for praying for us. Uh, everything went well, and he ended up having surgery, but he's doing much better. So thank you so much. Also, I want to do just a quick shout out to our staff and ministry leaders, and just it's amazing to be able to be gone, and uh, the church didn't miss anything, didn't miss a beat, uh, and even with Grant Sanders over here, they, nothing burnt down, so that's a plus, and no, they, he did a great job, and everybody here in the office did a great job, so thank you so much uh, to all of you. We're going to start a brand new series today, um, it's called My Secret Heart, and we're going to be talking about... Uh, just things that we hold in our hearts that we sometimes are afraid of other Christians knowing about, finding out about. Maybe sometimes you want to hide these things, even if you think from God. It's like, I don't want God to know this because he may be mad at me. He may be upset at me. And uh, it's really contrasted to our sacred heart because we all have sacred hearts. We like to come. We like to worship. We raise our hands. But then there are still things within us that we want to hold back. And some of these things that we're going to be talk about is, uh, talking about are things like prejudice. Like maybe you have certain feelings toward certain people that you don't even know why they're there, those feelings, or certain misconceptions about, about life and the world. We're going to be talking about doubts. Maybe you're one of those people that you sing, I believe in God the Father, I, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe that He was resurrected, but you're like, do I really believe that? Maybe, maybe you have some doubts. Maybe you don't want anyone to know. Do I really believe that Jesus was, you know, had risen from the dead? Do we believe that God is all-powerful and almighty, that he created everything, but, but there is this one science class that's telling me something else, or at work, you know, I do this, and, you know, it just, I just don't know how it all works. You may have doubts. And so if so, this series is going to be for you. We're going to be talking about hatred. All of us have been hurt by other people. And maybe you hold that hurt in your heart and you let it simmer and you've let it grow and you just cannot forgive someone or seem that you can't forgive someone. And, and that's just there in your heart as part of a secret. And you don't want anyone to know. We've been talking, we're going to be talking about things like lust. You know, there are even as followers of Jesus, desires within us that we know shouldn't be there, and that we want gone, but yet it seems like getting freedom from the, those thoughts is, is hard. And today, we're going to start this series by talking about despair. What do you do when you find yourself in a state where you can't, where you feel certain things, and you seem that you can't shake them off, and they just keep coming back to you? And along with the idea of despair, there's a more extended, when you are in despair for so long, it can, it can be considered to turn into depression. And sometimes what it can be considered clinical depression. And how do we deal with that as Christians? I can tell you right away, there's a stigma. There's a stigma related to these uh, just conditions. Because many of us have gotten this idea, and I don't even know where this came from, by the way, Maybe from the 80s, you know, health and wealth gospel that was preached so much on TV. But we have this idea that when you become a Christian, everything is going to be rosy. Everything is going to be better, right? It's like all of a sudden, it's like when you have those pictures that you take, you know, and, and it looks okay. But then you do the effect that they have on the phone and everything looks more colorful. And the blah, blues, and reds all of a sudden look vibrant and, and clear and crisp. And you look so much happier. And you're like, you know, can Christ do that to me? It's like I became a Christian. And you want like, okay, Christ, hit that button. Make me look crispier and happier and better and brighter. And it's like, mine isn't working. You know, what's going on? So we have this idea that when you become a Christian, life is just going to be happier. And so then when we start, you know, life happens. We're going to talk about how this happens in a minute. But life happens, and then you maybe feel, you know, and you may be going through a moment of despair, through times of depression. And what do we Christians do? We do what's best. We find the most simplistic 
you know, out of touch with reality explanation sometimes, right? It's like, oh, you just lack faith. You just need to believe more. You need to read your Bible more. We kind of shame. There's some shame related to this. You need to pray harder. We need to walk closer to God. You know, maybe there's just a hidden sin that this person is dealing with, and that's why he or she feels the way that they feel. Not only is there this stigma, you know, in the Christian circles, but also there's a personal struggle. Because I can tell you that anyone that's dealing with depression or with, you know, a state of despair, they don't want to be there. There is this frustration because you're unable to control your mind and your feelings to get out of this rut, what seems to be a rut. And so we just, you know, are frustrated personally. We're afraid of talking about it because of the Christian stigma and, and taboos that there may be out there. And so, and then there's this whole idea of like, man, is being in depression or despair a sin and so there's all kinds of ideas going around in our heads and if you're dealing with this this message is for you this morning but if you may you may not be dealing with this directly but maybe you know someone and so I'm going to tell you four things about depression that I hope help you this morning uh, not only to deal with it personally to decide to fight it but also if you are a family member or a friend of someone who's struggling with this, I hope that this helps you from God's word. The first thing that I want to clear up is that despair and depression are not a sin. Despair and depression are not a sin, but are the result of a fallen world. Despair and depression are the result of a fallen world. I'm going to give you some statistics on this issue it is reported that 1 in 10 Americans are affected by depression. That means we can count the number of people that are in this room. And 10% of that number is probably dealing statistically with some kind of depression. It could be a little more maybe by some statistics. But here is the really important number that I want you to pay attention to. Over 80% of those who are clinically depressed are not receiving treatment. That means that from that 10%, 8 out of 10 of those people who could be receiving treatment and getting better are not receiving treatment, which is really alarming. That, that tells me that 80% of people that are dealing with these feelings are ha trying to handle all those feelings alone. And that really, that statistic doesn't change whether you're a Christian or not, which is why we're talking about it here. We want to bring light to these issues. An estimated... 121 million people around the world suffer from depression, but uh, people and researchers think that this number could be three times as high. People just haven't said anything about it. And then here's where it gets even, you know, harder to, to deal with. You really, really we, we need to grasp this, the reality of this. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States of all ages, for all ages, and depression is linked to two-thirds of those suicides. And so this is something that we are a condition that when it, it grips a person, it can definitely affect the way that they function. The danger is that we can keep it hidden. And so we show up to church, and, you know, we act happy or normal, we, you know, you wear your Sunday's best and you smile, go through the motions. But inside, 10% of us, statistically at least, are dealing with these issues. Now, what causes depression? I want you to just make a mental checklist, okay? Just to, you can check mark it in your head. You don't have to raise your hand. But if, I just want you to put it in your heart and say, maybe you've dealt with some of these circumstances that can lead to a moment of despair or even being in depression, in a state of depression. Here's some of the things. Maybe you have had traumatic events like abuse, whether it's sexual or physical or verbal. Maybe you just experienced violence in your household growing up. You weren't a part of it, but you saw mom and dad, you know, fight or, you know, physical violence. And you wanted it to stop, but you couldn't help it. And it just left a mark in you. Maybe you have had or have or dealing with relational problems. You want to hang out with mom or, you know, you wish you could have that relationship with your kids 
or your parents or your siblings and it just isn't happening and it's so unhealthy around you it just makes you sad or maybe it's just your marriage you've been working at it for so long and it just seems that it will never get better and it's just a source of sadness maybe for you it's crushing disappointment it's disappointments of some sort you know that's not me but there are people that plan out their whole lives right since the moment they're little you know, you're like, I'm going to go and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an astronaut and you know, I'm going to do this or I'm going to be a doctor, whatever. You know, they plan it all out. Or the girls, it's like, you know, I'm going to marry, I'm going to find this really kind, good-looking, rich guy, you know, and I'm going to do this and we're going to have so many kids. And then, and then nothing of that happens or something happens, sickness or disease. Or maybe, you know, you weren't able to go to college or simply you haven't found the right person. And you seem like it's almost late for you. Or maybe, you know, you were able to get married and you can't have kids or you haven't been able. Or it took you a long time. Something there that is, you know, just a crushing disappointment. Maybe it's simply unchangeable circumstances. A chronic disease, you know, that brings you pain or discomfort. You know, for some of us, it's simply a chemical imbalance that you were born with. And I know it stinks. It, it, you know, there's no other way around it. You wish life could be different. You wish that you could look at life in a different way, but you just have clinical depression, and you've tried it all, and nothing seems to work. I know that my family carries the diabetes, you know, just a disease, and so on both sides of my family, so I know at some point it's going to be my turn, and the only thing that I can do is try to stay, eat better, and be healthier, but that's just the, the hand that was dealt to me, and some of you have been handed some pretty bad hands in life, it seems like, so this is what I want you to hear, let's turn to scripture, Psalm 42, verse 1, first thing that I want you to hear is that you're not alone, depression is the result of a fallen world, but you're not alone, you're not alone in this, um, I want you to hear verses 1 through 4. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Maybe you're in this spot that this psalmist says. Now, this is not David talking in this specific psalm. Many of us relate the psalms to David, and he wrote many of them. This is not him. But, but the psalmist here says that, you know, he's going through a moment of despair or maybe depression. We don't know, but he says, man, all day and all night, I just cry. You know, I can't stop crying. What's going on? And I'm seeking you, God. So the first thing that we need to understand is that it's not that he wasn't seeking God. And many of you can relate to that because you maybe are going through a time like this and you're like, I'm seeking God, I'm trying to find Him and I can't seem to find Him. He's not answering me. Even people notice around me that, you know, people ask, where is God? So I want you to know you're not the only one going through this. And Scripture, in fact, has plenty to say on the subject. There were many people from Moses to Elijah to King David to the prophet Jeremiah, to Jesus himself, to the apostle Paul, all of them at some point struggle with depression and moments of despair. Here's the second thing I want you to know. Desperation and hopelessness can make faith frustrating. Desperation and hopelessness can make faith very frustrating. Listen to verses 6 and 7. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. Listen to the psalmist here, just talking about his soul. He says, and my soul is downcast within me. And here's what's referring to. I told you the most dangerous part about depression is the fact that it can be hidden. The fact that you can hide it, but within you, there's this weight, this burden. And the psalmist here describes it like waterfalls. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to stand under a waterfall, and it don't have to be too high for the weight of the water to really crush you. And, you know, sometimes it even hurts. 
or many of you, if you've been to the ocean, you know what a wave can do to you. It can just toss you back and forth. It can pull you under and, you know, flip you multiple times. And when you're a kid, it's fun. And when you get to be an adult, it's like, that's not so fun anymore. It just, you know, I get rashed from the sand all over. I get sand in places that shouldn't be sand. And it's just not fun anymore. And that's what the pressure is like. Like your waves throw me all over. They just crash on me and, and swept over me. The psalmist is saying, man, there's such a big burden. And maybe you're feeling that burden right now. And you know what it does? It makes faith really frustrating. Because one of the trademarks of depression and despair is hopelessness. A kind of hopelessness that is debilitating. That you just don't know how you can keep going. In fact, people's ability to function are decreased. And, and here's what I want you to know, because this is really important before we move on. Because you, if you're going through a time like this, you need to hear the next, what I'm going to say next. I was talking to a counselor this week, trying to do more research on the subject, and I've been reading, and everything was kind of pointing to it, but the counselor just kind of put it all together for me, and she said, you know, in clinical research, says that people who live in depression have an overactive amygdala. In amygdala, it's an almond size and shaved, you know, just a little part of your brain. And what it takes care of is the emotional side. And when it's overactive, what it does, it's, it slows down your brain's ability to process thoughts and to control your emotions, your moods. When your amygdala is overactive, literally, emotions can take over and there's nothing that your brain can do to stop them. Now, here's what it does to people. It puts you in a certain mode of, of thinking, a certain way of thinking, where you want to take action to receive immediate results. In fact, people that have struggled with PTSD, it puts them in a, basically, let's say that it's called fight, flight, freeze mode. That they want to do something just now, whatever it takes to survive. And maybe that's where you are right now, because you may, that's what makes people do like, I need to read my Bible 10 times more right now so that God will release me from this from this feeling I need to pray harder and you ask your family members your friends pray for me you come to church to the pastor or you go to a counselor desperate and you just want to do whatever it takes to stop these feelings because that's the mode that your brain is it, it, exa- it requires immediate results and here's what I want you to hear more than likely, you will not get immediate results. I need you to realize that if you're struggling through and with depression right now. You will not get immediate results. And this is what makes faith frustrating during these times. Because then you're saying, basically, here's what people think. I'm doing everything that I can, God, and where are you? I'm doing everything that I can, and so what are you doing? And you feel resentful, or you feel angry, become angry at God, we're not giving you the results that your brain is asking so that it can stop feeling those feelings. And so then when this happens, you don't hear from God. It reinforces the hopelessness, which sends you on this spiral all over again. So it's like a vicious cycle that you get in. That's kind of the physiology of depression. So I want you to be aware of this. Because this is going to be a battle of, an, of your attitude, okay? And we're going to talk about that. So number two, desperation and hopelessness can make faith frustrating, which leads us to number three. In spite of our feelings, God walks with us through the dark times of our lives. So if you hear anything, please hear this. In spite of your feelings, God is walking with you through these dark times of your life. Let's listen to verses 8 through 10 of chapter 42, Psalm 42. He says, By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? I don't know, but many times the enemy, an enemy that we all have, the Bible calls him Satan, is going to try to remind you 
and ask you, what is your God? And in times of desperation and hopelessness, you need to act on the truth that God is walking with you. You may not feel him, but he is with you. Proverbs 12, 25 says this, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Anxiety is the cause of depression when you have an anxious heart, but a good word will cheer it up. And I want to give you a couple of good words. You can look him up if you want to, but you don't have, you don't have to. I want you to listen just now to what Psalm 46, 1 through 5 says. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose stream may glad the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. God wants you to know that he is everly, ever present when you're in trouble. He is an ever present help when you're in trouble. So even though your feelings may be telling you that he isn't there, God is there with you. He wants to walk with you. Sam Williams say you need to act on the truth. And I know that maybe some of you are skeptical. That, that you, you think, man, I've tried this and it hasn't worked. What I'm going to tell you is don't expect immediate results because you won't get them. But he is there with you. And here's the opportunity. This is called reframing, but I see it as an opportunity. For those of you who may be struggling with depression right now or despair, I'm going to tell you that you have the opportunity to show God the purest, strongest kind of faith that you will ever experience in your life. When you don't see him, don't feel him around you. When you don't know that you can see him and feel him there, and you still believe that he's walking with you, and you trust his word, you are really showing the best kind of faith that you can ever. And, and here's what you need to remember, that depression or despair is not a sign of God's absence. He's not gone. He's there with you. And here's what you need to know here as well. Don't give in to any perspective other than God's perspective. He's the only one that you need to listen to. So in spite of our feelings, God walks with us through the dark times of our lives. And lastly, fighting depression involves changing your attitude more than your symptoms. Fighting depression involves changing your attitude more than your symptoms. So if you were to read Psalm 42 twice during the psalm in verse 5 and verse 11, you see the author saying the same thing. And here's what he says on those two verses. It's like he splits the psalm in two. And, and in fact, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, at one point, were one psalm. They weren't two different ones. And he actually says the same thing in Psalm 43. So three times he says this phrase. Listen to it. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, the psalmist didn't have personality disorder. He's not talking to himself. It's a literary form in which he's questioning himself. He's like, I feel this way, but I know it's not all of it. There's more to it. He says, I, my soul feels downcast. It feels disturbed. I'm going through a very hard time in my life. But yet, the other part of me is choosing to put my hope in God. And I'm going to praise him even if I don't see immediate changes. Fighting depression involves changing your attitude even if the symptoms remain. I want you to forfeit obtaining immediate results. Can God heal me? You may be asking, can God, can, can God heal me? Yes, he can. Will he choose to do so? I don't know. You're free to ask him. But here's one thing I want you to realize. How many of us have experienced a broken bone? You know, maybe some of us, and it hurts those in it. And there's nothing that they can do. And you know what? It's going to take time for that bone to heal. And, but here's what, the question that I want you to ask. How many times have prayed that a fracture is healed instantly? Probably none of you. 
You know that part of this fallen world is accidents and pain and hurts and that sometimes it takes time and God has allowed that to happen. And I'm going to tell you we need to remove those stigmas from depression, from despair and just know that it may take time for you to get better. That you're not going to be able to look at the end you know, right now, that you can only look at what's next, the next step today, and then tomorrow, and then the day after. And that just because God allows us to go through that process doesn't mean He isn't there. He's just allowed this to happen in this world. It's not perfect, and we can take consolation in the promises that He gives us of a different world, which we're going to read about here in a minute. But just know that just because it's going to take time doesn't mean that God isn't there. Here's how you can change your attitude as well. Accept the challenges depression poses to you. Just know what is coming. Have realistic expectations. You know, you don't go, if you've never run in your life, if you're going through a time where you, all you do is just, you know, eat chip, you know, potato chips and sit on the couch, you can't say, I'm going to go run a marathon tomorrow, right? You have to stand up and say, I need to eat healthier, I need to lay off the soda a little bit. And I'm going to just do one lap around the field today. Just one lap. And then tomorrow you may be able to do another lap even though you'll be sore. And then the day after you may be able to do two laps. And then the fourth day you may be able to do another two laps. And you know what? It's going to be a process. And that's the attitude you need to have when it comes to despair and depression. You may not be able to see the joy that God has for you down the road. But you need to say, today I'm going to choose to listen to you, God. And tomorrow I'm going to choose to listen to you. And here's what you need to do. Cultivate joy. Stacey Elridge says that despite the misconceptions of a Christian life that is just happier, she says, you know what? Actually, life is hard. Life is just going to be hard and sometimes it stinks. But here's the choice that you get. You do get a choice. We don't get a choice as to whether or not we get to pick, you know, life being easier or harder. Life is just going to be hard, but the choice that we get to do is which kind of hard do we choose? Here's what she says. I'm going to read a part of, 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 of a uh, writing that she has on the subject. She says, it's hard to be kind to the mean neighbor. It's hard as well to be convicted later of being, uh, of being unloving. It's hard to have a loving but tough conversation with a friend, but it's also hard to have one and then... Have offense and distance creep into that friendship. It's hard to fight for a marriage, and it's hard to lose a marriage. It's hard to break an addiction, and it's hard to be captive to one. It's hard to live under the cloak of depression, and it is also hard to step toward healing. It is hard to face the story of your life, and it is hard to live in denial. It's hard to reject the pressure of other people's demands, and it's hard as well to live under them. It's hard to set aside time every single day to press into the heart of God. Sometimes it's even hard to pray. But it's, hard. it's harder to live your day with strength, hope, and integrity if you don't do those things. It's hard to pursue living water. And it's hard to live in a dry land with, you know, with thirst. We get to choose our heart. And the decision we make will either lead to cultivating our hearts with hope-filled joy or deadening them with weariness, with weariness and despair. Every morning when I wake up, I can guess that there is going to be hard things in the day. But the heart I choose is to follow Christ wherever He leads, and that heart leads to life and joy always, even in the midst of suffering. What she writes about is, that, that we just need to choose joy, even in the midst of the hard times that life presents to us, or just depression. Here's the last word I have. If you're struggling with this, remember the gospel again and again. Revelation 21, 4 gives us a picture of what it will be like when Jesus comes back. And he says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And I want you to know that there is hope 
and there is a Savior for everyone who's dealing with depression today and despair. You don't have to remain there. God is offering to walk with you every step of the way. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for who you are. I pray that you allow us as your people, uh, Lord, to have the purest kind of faith as we, Lord, uh, give to you the secret part of our hearts that sometimes we don't even want to think about. In fact, we want to hide those things from ourselves because they're just painful. But Lord, through this series, would you allow us to bring him to the light, to bring him before you, and to allow you, Father, to shed light in hope, Lord, in growth. Let us be patient and let us see you at work, Lord, as we release these things to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.